Um, welcome to those of you who might not know. This is MFA Photo, Video and Related Media, School of Visual Arts. And this is the first uh, in-house production <laughs> of our Shine Flug lecture series. I'm happy to have everybody. Uh, any of the students here who haven't checked in and with the role, you must do so. If you don't do so, you will be marked absent. Uh, all the other guests, you're welcome. You can come back anytime. You don't even have to check in. There's a lot of friendly faces here and old ones that I know. Um, I'm very happy to have this gathering in person as we've done a couple of things with the students in the auditorium, but it's nice to be here. We have a very interesting panel tonight, uh, which will be moderated, conducted, and interlocked by Susie Linfield. Um, I first read a moving piece in the New York Times, I think it was May, late May of this past spring, uh, an op-ed article she wrote called, Should We Be Forced to See Exactly What an AR-15 Rifle Does to a 10-Year-Old Child? Um, opened up a lot of questions, positive and negative. I'm actually for being personally, I think we need and the press needs to show more of the reality of the violence and conflicts that are about us everywhere. But that's to be discussed tonight. Susie is a professor of journalism at NYU and uh, writes about the intersection of politics and culture and violence and conflict. She is the author of a book, Cruel Radiance, Photography and Political Violence, University of Chicago Press, and has received that book, got a uh, National Book Critics were, uh, Award uh, nomination and finalist, uh, The Lion's Den, Zionism and the Left, from Hannah Arndt to Noam Chomsky. She writes for all kinds of important journals and magazines, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The New Republic, The Nation, Guernica, and The Boston Review, all of which I read every week. And um, her books have been translated in multiple languages, including Turkish, Italian, Croatian, and Korean. She is a native New Yorker, and I'm so happy to have you here. Before, I'm going to let her introduce our other two panelists. But before I do, I want to thank Adam Bell and Randy West and Aaron Davis and Alice um, for Lee for our, their help in organizing this. And I want to tell the students I'm very proud of how the energies are moving here. And let's keep it going. Thanks. Everybody, can you hear me? Okay, so thank you for being here. Um, we'll start our event with the two artists here who will speak about and present uh, some of their work. We're then going to have a discussion among ourselves, and after that, we'll open up the floor to your questions. But before that, I wanted to say just a few words about the very vexing, complicated issue of photographs of violence. A few years ago, I was asked to speak at a conference about Susan Sontag in Stockholm. At that conference, I showed some of the so-called Caesar photographs. Some of you may have seen them. I'm actually not going to show them here because I think that sometimes it's more, it's, it's a different kind of thoughtful way to describe a photograph, but these photographs are widely available. You can find them. <clears throat> They're on uh, the websites of human rights uh, organizations, major newspapers, etc. So the Caesar images were taken by a Syrian police photographer at the behest of the Bashar al-Assad government 
document the gulag of torture chambers in Syria, where the Assad regime has tortured tens of thousands of people to death. It is not clear why Assad wants his own atrocities photographed, though we know that this has been true of other heinous regimes, including the Nazis and the Khmer Rouge. In any case, the Caesar photographs are among the most horrible things I have ever seen. They show people with their eyes gouged out, apparently while they were alive, grievously slashed and wounded, electrocuted, and starved to death. Caesar, that's a code name. He now lives in witness perfection somewhere in Northern Europe, was so appalled by what he was documenting that he began to smuggle thousands of these photographs out of the country into the West. And he himself eventually escaped with his family. The photographs were certified by forensic experts, and they were very, very widely shown. In the New York Times, they were front page news, in many, many other newspapers all over the world, by human rights groups. They were also shown to world leaders, including John Kerry, who is now the Secretary of State, and to the Foreign Minister. In addition, they were exhibited, uh, anyone could go see them at the United Nations. The result was nothing. And this seems, to, uh, perhaps alas, to prove Sontag's point in art photography, that photographs of violence can have no impact unless there is already some kind of extant political will. But what fascinated me is that during the mission at the conference, a young woman, probably about 20 or so, came up to speak to me. She was the daughter of Eritrean parents who had been given political asylum. She told me that she thought it was disrespectful to show these photographs. I told her that I thought it was the Assad regime, what the Assad regime had done, not the photographs that were disrespectful. Well, that's a very anodyne word. She asked if I would show the photographs and if someone in the audience was a relative of one of the victims in the photos. I told her that, painful though that would undoubtedly be, I would show them. Ours was a friendly discussion, and we agreed to disagree. I brought up this discussion when the conference resumed. A young man rose from the audience and identified himself as a Syrian refugee who had gained a political asylum in Sweden. He told us that people all over Syria were circulating these photos, and he urged the West not to turn away from them. We want you to know what's happening to, happening to us, he said. If you think you are protecting us by not looking, it is really yourselves that you are protecting us. So he strongly implied that sensitivity and so-called respect can sometimes be a form of abandonment and betrayal. All of this is to say, again, that why an image is shown, how it is circulated, used, understood, misunderstood, debated, contested, is enormously complex and something I hope will be discussed at time. I will only add, in terms of these photographs, that a new tranche of them has recently surfaced that there is now a Syrian group called the Caesar Families Association, and that prosecutors are hoping the photographs will one day be used in war crime trials. As for Bashar Assad, he remains firmly in power. In interviews, he has suggested that the photographs were photoshopped, and he dismissed them as going for propaganda. Okay, so um, I'm going to be very brief in my introduction. Uh, both of our panelists have done a lot of work. I, I can't go into all of it, so I'm going to be brief. Uh, Kathy Shore was born, was born in Brooklyn. Her work crosses the borders of documentary portraiture and street photography. Her work has been shown in galleries in the United States and Europe and was featured in the celebrated Isa or Limoges in France. 
her book called Shot, 101 Survivors of Gun Violence in America, was published in 2017. She started a nonprofit by the name of Shop Be the People. Her current project is called Shot We the Mothers, featuring mothers who have lost children to gun violence. So far, the project has represented the city of Philadelphia. She is currently working. Will Chan is an artist, activist, and mutual aid organizer. His statements on the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003 are considered some of the most important works in the response to that war. His works are used as force material and held by notable institutions like Harvard, the Tate Modern, the Tim Hetherington Library, Yale, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He's the director of Hope Gallery, a window gallery Lower East Side and co director of Cancer Gallery. So we're going to turn it over to you now. Hi. Nothing? Hi. <laughs> I'm I'm still kind of nervous. So I'm kind of working my I'm I'm like working my way into like being less nervous. Um, but you can can I take a can I do one of these things with a mask? All right. I'm I'm getting I'm getting better now. Uh, I am going to do a 15 minute timer so that. Twenty seconds in. <laughs> There's like no energy here. Anyone? Nothing? <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, uh, that's that's thirty seconds I wasted. Um, I, I like to joke a lot. It's just uh, I think we're talking a lot, a lot about a lot of serious things, and that's just the way I cope. So in, in no way does that mean I'm taking making light of it. It's just for me to kind of get get going. Um, I am a recent-ish girl graduate. Went to school with Erin. Um, so. I, my, my art practice or life practice goes all over the place, but to me, ultimately, what I was trying to do after school was to find a holistic life where art and, and life kind of all merge together, so I don't feel like I was eight people at once. So I guess ultimately what we're getting at is what can art do. So I'm just gonna go chronologically because that I want I want to kind of convey my mindset. So this is grad school. And in grad school, um, can everyone hear me in the back? In grad school, um, so kind of wheel back, I'm a veteran of the US Army, and I served in the invasion of Iraq in 2002, 2003. And these were snapshots from them, uh, what Susie would once call mementos, uh, that the Syrian, uh, not Syrian, some of the soldiers would take photographs, and they're kind of mementos. And that's kind of it for me. It was kind of traveling momentos. Nothing nefarious. It was just kind of like I would never do it again, I figured. So these photographs were done in Iraq during the invasion as a soldier only. I was not a photographer. And it was done, a lot of these were done with disposable camera. And then, it so I'm going to click through this real quick because it became a book that I made in my second or my three years here, which I will leave some. And um, I won't get too much into that. And then for my thesis, the year after, a lot of a lot of people lost their lives doing what they were told. So I'm, like I said, I don't know if it was a mistake or not. And I don't want to believe that I went over there for the wrong reasons. I went back to Iraq in 2015, maybe to help, maybe to find peace, or maybe I just couldn't let go. I don't want us to be the bad guys. Hey, mm. I don't know why, but I just know. Mm. What are you thinking about?
I don't know. I don't know if I wanted to be there. Or I shouldn't say I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be there. Cut the country. I guess leaving the family hurt most. I'm glad I went. Glad I did what I did. I think I worked as hard as anybody else did. And, uh, it is what it is. I was put in for a couple of awards that I don't know if I was deserving of or not. But I think all my... shouldn't say I think all, but the majority of the people thought I deserved them. So... That made me more proud than anything. Kids, kids, I mean, play, it's played a major role in your, in your life right now. It's, it's actually like divorce right now. I'm divorced. Your love life is kind of pretty much it's over right now. It's kids is what you got left right now. That's how you, how you, your life right now depends on the kids, I guess, in a way. Without the kids, there's nothing much left in the world for you to survive. Do you think about the kids in Iraq? They still give me a nightmare. I kids hard time right now too, and then still got a big problem with that. Do you see these kids? Well, how old are these kids? You know, right? That's... It's the teenager type. It's about 12 to 15 about those ones. And you see them as enemies. You don't see them as kids, right? I see them as... As like a... When I see a bunch of them stand, I just get scared of them. It's not like an enemy. In a way, I think it's they still pure. It's just kids. As soon as they take a move, that's how I don't see them as kids. But I just gotta follow my orders. Can't do anything. Just gotta take my chance. But basically, I was uh, interviewing for my thesis the people I served with, and by then it was pretty clear to me that America really messed up. But yet we we didn't want to deal with it. So that was kind of like my project for that film. And then, um, so, so what, what did we do after school? Um, I think most of it was just trying to find ourselves. Uh, the book was going pretty well, and um, it, was, it received some nominations and award. And I, you know, like, I think most everyone here was kind of go forward, like maybe show it in an exhibition, things like that. Uh, but then I was also a very political person. I was born in Hong Kong, and I go back pretty often. Uh, my parents still live there. And um, these images are, are from Hong Kong in 2019. I can't speak too much about it because there's literally a law that says I can't speak about it. So I think I downloaded these from the internet. Um, and I assume these are from Hong Kong in 2019. And these were kids who were protesting, and then because they use uh, what's called octopus card, uh, kind of like a metro card, uh, but that could be tracked. So people were leaving money on the metro card machines so that they could travel without being tracked by the octopus. Um, China has a much deeper level of information on the citizen as a general statement. So it's just about mining data. They will, I guess many of you already know. It's, it's just, they have a lot of data on a citizen. It's just a matter of do they want to mind it. Um, this is also an image I downloaded from the internet in 2019. And most of these people are either prosecuted or they, are, they have left Hong Kong. Um, and everything becomes retroactive. Even though the law started in 2020, and this happened in 2019, 
people in this picture, some of them are being prosecuted now retroactively. Um, but there's nothing wrong with believing in what's right. I was not going to include this, but then I think the point for me is always connecting all the threads that, you know, whether it's Iraq, we, we, we should learn about Iraq from what's happening in Ukraine and the connection with all the people in Iran today and Hong Kong and so on. All right, so um, when I got back from, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, this show was up. It was perfect. Like my whole work is about uh, the, the the conflicts that the U.S. had in uh, in the Middle East, and like to me, this is the perfect show that it's like right up my alley. So I went to the show, and I really didn't feel like it has everything. And then I, I spoke to the curators, and um, and I had my book placed it in in the library, but then they were I didn't, and then I did not know at the time, but there were a lot of backlash by the artists in the show. And um, a lot of them refuse to continue to show the work. Um, uh, they, some of them just took it off. Uh, some artists asked the curators to stop it, and they would not stop it or alter it. And I'm part of uh, the veterans art movement. And we, along with many of the artists, we, we started protesting the show and said that it's, it's a lot of bullshit because and this is the beginning of me understanding the institutional issues, uh, the board of trustees. Uh, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of things that drive art that we don't talk about in art or in art school. So anyone interested, uh, you can look it up yourself. So I was, I, I was just getting to a point where I just wanted, I feel like my work, and this is not being arrogant, was not being talked about. You know, a, a soldier who served, who is apologizing and taking accountability for my role as a U.S. soldier. I was wrong. And it starts with apologizing, but also being accountable. Their feelings are great. So I, uh, the book is in, in PS1, and then whenever they have a curator tour, I would insert myself into it afterwards, politely, and talk about it. And then I would ask them to go to the bookstore, and I would give you a book, and in return, we will continue talking. So I did that. Uh, this is the associate curator somewhere in the back. And I did it with the chief curator, because they, they would not let me do this uh, on a panel, because uh, I didn't know the backstory. There was a, one of the board members was actually owns the company, like Blackwater, or the new iteration of Blackwater, which are the mercenaries that we, we, we use in Iraq. So I, this was like my first kind of in, intervention performance, so to speak. So, so the second thing I did, I'm also very political in, as like a general statement. So I went, to, I went to all these democratic rallies, and we hated Trump by then, right? By then it's, it's obvious that we hated Trump. So I went to all these democratic parties, uh, rallies, uh, early, I don't know, whenever that was. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, but you could bear with me. It's a bit of a question, but it's really a statement. Um, I've been following a few uh, candidates um, Senator Wong, uh, Senator uh, Sanders, and Mr. Yang, all really good people. I think we, we some of the best group of people that we have seen in a while. And, um, but in the last week or two, I think, I, I'm not from New Hampshire, I'm sorry, just to be transparent, I'm from Brooklyn, and I drove, I drove from uh, Brooklyn this morning with my... my Last two weeks with the escalating tensions in the Middle East, two people on TV have talked about de-escalating, and they were very firm about it. One of them was Mr. Yang, and the other one was Sen Senator uh, Sanders. Am I correct? Is that? Yeah. yeah, and I apologize. I don't know everything, and I'm, I'm just one person. I, but I'm also here, as much as I'm here to see Mr. W uh, Mr. Yang, I'm also here to be with my fellow American. I am a combat veteran from Iraq. Yeah. I love my country. I, I think I, I went into the service because I'm an immigrant, and I felt like I always had to prove myself. And I had some warped idea of what being American is, but I'm, I'm 44 now. I'm a parent. My son reluctantly is sitting next to me. And I think I found, I've grown to understand that there's a lot of people who are as patriotic as me. Like, James Bowen is probably just as patriotic as any service person. And everyone here, whether you're a teacher, a, a doctor, anyone 
who represent the right values. So in 2016, when they said make America great, okay, I thought they're talking about the same great that I'm thinking, meaning strong, with a lot of humanity, with a lot of humbleness. That's what I thought great was. Right. I didn't know that this is what they meant by great. Um, so, kind of finish out. So, kind of like, <clears throat> and this thing happened. The pandemic happened, and um, so that's where I'm at. And so it became like a lot of like kind of reflection, like you know, what does being an artist mean for myself, community, like a holistic practice, um, and not settling the idea. Like once we get out of COVID, if and when that completely happens what type of world we would like to contribute to. Um, so I kind of thought a lot about that. So around early 2020, I, I me and Guadalupe Maravilla, uh, I don't know, uh, he's, he's, he's a pretty big shot, big deal artist. Uh, we started, you know, he, I, he helped me, and I just say I helped him do a lot of mutual aid. And then uh, we've been doing this e to this day. Um, and the picture on the left was from early in the pandemic. He was literally, like, we were going to, uh, buy food in books and we were and then this is this is last week or two this is it became a sanctuary now so have you seen the the, the drop-off stuff at pplw or brooklyn museum that's this and and last thing another person who i really admire oops maybe i should just get to the last thing which is what i'm doing now all right one last video <laughs> But this is my current thing. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. One way to say yes to a need that we all have is food stuff. You know, you gotta you gotta eat. You're welcome. Every other week we distribute approximately 140 bags of food. Each bag a solid three to five meals. This is the best salad ever. You're welcome. Make things less shitty for whoever. That feels like the only thing that humans are supposed to do. Just to kind of close with that, um, I think right now in my mind, um, you know, I have a better understanding of art market versus art world. Um, I'm past that kind of first five year phase where a lot of people drop out of art. And I'm just really straightforward. Um, it doesn't mean everything I say is correct, correct, but it's been my truth. And I think if I'm gonna ask you for 15, 20 minutes, um, you would get the truest truth for me at least. And um, this will be five to 10 year, I mean the five to 10 year range of post-grad. And um, what has sustained me going forward is the belief that my practice can, can serve to be a better art world than the pre-Trump, pre-COVID art world. Art market is not the art world, nothing wrong with it. Commercial gallery is not the art world, also nothing wrong with it. But the vast majority of art if you only look at those avenues, are not going to be seen. They are driven by sales. And most people who go from studio to gallery to exhibition, back to storage, those art 99% of the time will, will eventually be thrown away. Um, so for me, this makes sense for me. It's worth my time. Otherwise, and there's no money in art for the most part. So to do something for no money, it has to be worth my time. So that's, that's my little story.
Hi, everyone. I'd like to first thank Charles and the SBA department for inviting me um, to this event. And I am an SBA graduate from the undergraduate. So I love SBA, and um, I'm so happy that I went to this school. So while I'm getting set up here, um, I'm showing you two projects that I've done. The first one is shot 101 survivors of gun violence in America. This, um, thank you. This project started at the end of 2013, and I finished at the end of 2015. I traveled to 45 cities around America and photographed every race, many ethnicities, ages 8 to 80, from high and low profile shootings. Gun owners and an NRA member are included. And most of the survivors, I'd say 85%, were photographed at the physical location where they were shot. So this is the background on the project. I'm going to show 45 images. I think there's 15 from my second project that I'm working on now. If I rush through people, it has nothing to do with how I feel about the project and the importance of what's happened to them, but I want to make sure that you get to see everyone. Okay, so. Okay, this is Megan from Miami, Florida. She's the cover of the book. Antonius from Brooklyn, New York. He's the first person that I photographed. And, um, He's the first person that, thank you, that um, I asked if I could photograph his scar. I thought of it when I met him. This is about seven weeks into his being shot. And I thought, mm, maybe that would be a good thing to photograph the scar. And I asked him if I could do it. And he just whipped up his shirt and said, sure. So then I realized that that was going to be part of the project as well. So. This is uh, Karina in um, Fort Collins, no, Aurora, Colorado. Marlis in Canoga Park, California. And um, she's such a prim and proper woman. And then when I asked her if I could um, photograph, she's the oldest person in the project, if I could photograph her scar, all of a sudden she just whipped up her shirt like Antonia's had. And she was shot through the heart by her husband of 41 years. This is Shanessa in um, Virginia, right outside, uh, outside of Norfolk. Josh in uh, California, uh, Pacific Grove. This is Shirley in Indianapolis. She also was shot by her husband. This is about less than two months out of the hospital, probably six weeks. And she was shot in front of both of her children in the nursery school parking lot. This is Joe in Philadelphia, and I'm going to ask you to remember Joe because he has something to do with my second project. He uh, was a SEPTA bus driver of the year, retired, was shot th on three separate occasions, twice while driving the bus in Philadelphia. Sharika, a deputy sheriff, mother of seven kids, shot by her husband in the Walmart parking lot. And that was one of the reasons I used this specifically to talk about how important location was. Because if you can't identify with Sharika because she's a police officer, because she's black, because she's a mother, for any number of reasons, then I think you probably will identify with the fact that this happened in the Walmart parking lot, because most Americans shop in Walmart. So that was um, one of the reasons why I felt location was extremely important for this project. Kathleen uh, in Orvilla, Texas, her husband also shot her. And then you can see there's different, uh, this is a upper middle class woman. Another thing that was really important to show all different kinds of people, that this didn't just happen to one type of person, it happens to all Americans. Allie in Kansas City, 15 years old, her friend's uh, father was a truck driver, put his gun on the table, and I learned this from uh, about guns, something I never knew. If a gun, if the chambers are empty, 
it doesn't mean the gun is not loaded. There's a bullet that drops down. And two of the people in the project were shot because of this accidental kind of thing. Her, her best friend was the daughter of the truck driver and shot her playing around with the gun. This is Chloe in Kansas City also. Sarah uh, in Kenner, Louisiana, shot uh, her, she was sitting in her car as a 13 year old and the car was hijacked when her mother went into a store. This is Janine in Queens, New York, her corrections officer at Rikers Island, husband, captain of the corrections officers, shot her in their kitchen. And 20% of the project is domestic violence and it's amazing how domestic violence is such a cliche. Every single one of these women from all different socioeconomic backgrounds, all of the men said basically, if I can't have you, no one can. This is Corey in Fort Collins, Colorado. Raven in um, Little Haiti in Miami. Alyssa shot by her husband also in Kentucky. Uh, this is the Bishop of Scott, the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Utah. He was shot as a teenager when he was working in a record store. This is James in Bozeman, Montana. Tanaya in Augusta, Georgia, shot in her third grade classroom when a fellow classmate came in with a gun and was playing with it. Dana in uh, Fort Hood in Texas, she was one of the service officers uh, that was shot by the psychiatrist. People, you won't even remember these things because they happened maybe eight years ago. We have so many tragedies that it's like, oh yeah, Fort Hood, a lot of service people got shot there. But it's ha it, we lose track of all of these uh, mass shootings. This, these two photos next are of Chris in uh, Bear, Delaware. He was sitting in his car and was robbed by somebody in his neighborhood. John in Belleville, Illinois. He was a police officer who uh, there was a, a double murder suspect and he went with a shield that was supposed to be bulletproof to break in the door of this house and the shield malfunctioned and he's blind and disfigured from that um, tragedy. Jeff, he's an NRA member in Memphis. He was shot eight times. Isaiah in uh, Milwaukee and Isaiah was a, probably six foot six and one of the saddest things was said to me by Isaiah, he was shot on two separate occasions um, and at night by in diff different uh, men did this and he said to me that uh, I'm, I'm really afraid to go out at night and all of a sudden I it was like this thing happened where I felt that this big guy who I had to make sit on a bench because otherwise I would have been photographing like this I felt like he became this little tiny five-year-old and it just sent chills through me because this man is now afraid to go out at night. Martha hailing a taxi in Columbia, Columbia South Carolina, random shooting. Jazz Beer in um, Oak Creek, Wisconsin. This is the Sikh temple shooting. And this is uh, Carissa, who is one of the people that for two years I tried to get a Native American for the project, which was extremely difficult. I was taken down many paths that all ended. And Carissa is the 101st person I photographed in Sizerton, South Dakota, and um, she too, domestic violence. She actually bought her boyfriend the gun. He killed three of her friends and killed himself, and she was the only survivor. The community turned on Carissa because it was her boyfriend and she survived. So she, when I met her, she, um, she was going, this is on the reservation, she was going to leave because 
He just couldn't live there anymore. So this is all the collateral damage of gun violence, these kind of things that you, you hear these stories and it's just like, wow. The last person from SHOT that I'm showing is Ryan from Atlantic City, New Jersey. So remember Joe, the bus driver from Philadelphia? So I, I become friendly with a lot of people that I photograph because even though I'm with them a short time, the it's very intense and we it's like meeting somebody and instantly, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, you're connected to them by this bond of what you're doing. So Joe, um, in March of 2021, he, he always writes to me uh, little messages and stuff, and he wrote me this desperate uh, email. Please, he calls me Miss Cat. Please, Miss Cat, we need your help. I need you to come to Philadelphia. A mutual friend of ours had just lost her second son to gun violence. And he was afraid for Movida that she was going to do something to herself because of this. And she sa he said, we have so many mothers that I know in Philadelphia. Please come and, and do something. Like the book that you did for us survivors, do something for the mothers. So that was in March of 2021. In April of 2021, I, called Mo I had called Movida. I said, I don't know if you're going to want to do this, but Joe asked me if, if we could do this. And she said, I want to do it. So I went down to Philadelphia in April and photographed 51 mothers whose, um, whose, child, whose children were killed from gun violence. Now, I'm, I'm showing you right now um, pictures that were put together. We have a, a public art show in Philadelphia. So with my designer, I worked on these next images to put images, diptychs, triptychs, and uh, some single images and the words of the mothers, very important. So um, you're seeing what's hanging on the fence. These are large scale vinyl prints uh, on a fence in Philadelphia that uh, is across the street from Penn Presbyterian Hospital, which is one of the trauma centers in Philadelphia. So this is, ca oh, and uh, you mentioned mementos before. Uh, one of the, is, I asked the mothers to take me to a location that has significance to their child and also to bring mementos of their child. So this is Kathy with a basketball and her son was a basketball player. This is Lisa and um, that's in the neighborhood where her son was shot, right across from the park where he hung out. This is Therese, her uh, daughter, who you see in the back, was killed and left a two-year-old. So the girl is now about 15, and Therese is raising her. This is Evelyn, and that's her daughter in the background who was uh, killed when she was 18. This is Hope, and Hope's son, uh, I'm sorry, Hope's daughter also was a basketball player. This is uh, the Hank Gathers Center in Philadelphia, which is a, a three people actually took me to this um, location because they felt that it, it made such a difference in their child's life. This is Sam, and her 16-year-old son was killed, um, and she and her husband opened this uh, bar restaurant called Tanky's Tavern. So I'm photographing her in the bar, and. Those are her words. So I asked the people to, uh, at first I asked them to write something for me, and I started to get like these school compositions. And I was on Facebook with all of them, and I was seeing what, how people really felt and how people were angry and heartbroken. So I asked them if I could please, the mothers who were on social media, if I could please take words from their, their posts. So the words to the project are the social media, from social media posts of the mothers. This is Latrice, she lost her son. Uh, on the right, it, on, your, on my right is Sam, and on the left is Mykia. A lot of people had tattoos in memory of their children, so I wanted to have that shown. This is Marissa, who lost her eight-year-old daughter in um, uh, you know, a random shooting 
she was riding her bike and two guys started shooting and of course her Gabby died and Marissa is an incredibly powerful writer not a not a a writer a learned writer but a intuitive writer and very powerful and the, her police statement that she wrote is just I mean you, it, it was one of the most intense things that I've ever read so that's Marissa this is Movita, who I talked about before, who lost the two sons to gun violence, and that is a book that her first son, Charles, did for her when he was shot. And this is uh, Rowana, Tawana, sorry, and um, her son liked to fish, so she's over by the uh, river, the Delaware. And this is the last shot. Um, that's Sharon and Bert and Tahira. And that's, so I finished in Philadelphia and I'm working on this project in Miami now. And hopefully um, it's going to evolve into something where mothers from around America who have lost children to gun violence will start sending me their photographs. And um, then Shot We the People, which is the organization that um, the nonprofit that I put together, hopefully we'll be able to put up a website with these images to show that um, this is what, what's happening across this country to many, many people. Thank you. OK. Uh Thank you to you both. Uh, I want to open up with a general question that actually you raised, Will, uh, which is what can art do? We live in a very, very violent society. But you said one thing, Will, that uh, sort of puzzled me, if you could explain it. You said that there's a law preventing you from talking about the Hong Kong photos. But there can't be a law in the US. We still do have the First Amendment. So why are you not able to discuss them in the US? I mean, there, there could be a law pro prohibiting that. So there's a, there's a, so the law is uh, the National Security Act, I believe, that it's, uh, that it's in China. But in, in, their, in their way of phrasing it, it applies to everyone anywhere globally. So if you never step foot in China ever again or do business, yeah, it will not affect you. But they've been using that law to, to sanction uh, people, American Congress people, uh, and also a lot of exile uh, freedom uh, activists. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the question that you raised, for both of you, I hope to address, is what can art do? You raised that first in your piece. Sure. Your thoughts on that. And, and, and I would love to hear that from you as well, <laughs> but let me start. Um, um, I, I think we all think about this question at some point. Um, what can art do? Because you know, like it's 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 a lot out of our life uh, for it to not do anything. But so, my feeling is art does nothing. <laughs> um, but art changes the mind. I'm just kidding. Art art changes the the creator. I, it you know the work that I was doing at school was totally therapeutic, cathartic, and if nothing else. Um, I didn't waste any time because I, I felt I was a better person. And uh, in the school, there was, a lot of, there was a lot of people kind of mentoring me. So, so the first thing is it changes the mind, and it did for me. And then the next thing, hopefully your work is worth other people's time. And then when you put it out, it changes other people's perspective. And hopefully the people who, you know, well, I think a lot for me is as, as an artist, I have a role to give a perspective, but I also have to be a doer. Otherwise, the, if, the, if the whole society is just sharing memes and posts, no one, nothing ever gets done. So to me, I'm also very much a participant in doing, and I'm also receiving other people's art. Like, I'm, I'm totally blown away by, by your yeah. series. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, I, yeah, I'm a gun owner. I'm not a gun owner, but <laughs> I've used a lot of weapons in my life. That's, that's my roundabout answer. Uh, Kathy? 
we live in a society with an immense amount of violence, and we also see an immense amount of violence, even as, quote, entertainment, TV, movies, video games. So what, what kind of intervention, uh, if any, can art do? What, why, why do what you're doing? And why do it as photography? You could write a book. You know, there are various other things. So you've chosen photography. Uh, and I, I'm maybe speak to what it is you hope this project will achieve, if anything. So, I mean, I, I decided um, I decided um, maybe I, maybe about 12, maybe longer than that, I don't know, 15 years ago, that I was going to stop doing um, projects that were kind of, had no meaning to them really, other than, you know, like, uh, for instance, I did something about BFFs. It's like, okay, it's, it's, it's cute, good pictures in it, but it really isn't saying, it's not saying so much. And I just started to think that I should um, use what I do to uh, talk about or bring to others um, prob things that are bothering me about the world. That uh, I should use my photography as like artivism. And I decided that I just didn't want to do anything that didn't have meaning, a bigger meaning than the work. So, I mean, I'm, I don't, in, a, in a way, I don't think of myself as an artist. A, uh, artist, in some ways, has a, almost a, a negative feeling for me in photography because it's very self-absorbed. Um, you know, oh, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show my my bedroom, and oh, I'm gonna, you know, just show show how beautiful it. It just gets to be like, well, okay, that's nice, but what what's the meaning beyond that? So I felt that I needed to push what I could do to to make things change, and I don't know if things change from what I do, but. I feel that I have a responsibility to me to do what I can about things that really bother me and gun violence to me is just um, something that needs to be addressed and wasn't being addressed and it was always a black and white issue and there's so many shades of gray to it and they weren't being put out there, and it was very abstract. So I thought if I could bring a face to the, the subject and put real people into uh, people's minds, that it would humanize it, and then it would be something that um, could be talked about without people yelling. And as I said before, looking at places that are very familiar, that we all f frequent, or seeing people who might remind us of somebody that we know, or someone we would like to be, would make it easier to talk about. And I'm curious, I'm sure that the people that you're photographing, especially these mothers, have different reasons for wanting to do this. I'm sure some also turn you down. But what, what do you think is their motivation? Very few people have turned me down. And I'm not saying, I'm saying that because people really appreciate giving them a way to talk about something that's happened to them. So um, with the mothers, no one wants to feel forgotten. No one wants to have a, the person that they love most, their child, go up and smoke, so to speak, like everything. The person's gone, but then the memory's gone. The, and then once the memory goes, it's gone. So everyone says, uh, I'm so grateful and happy that you are uh, 
going to do this about my child. So it's, I mean, it, it, for a ter it's a terrible thing that turns into something that um, has, uh, has a redeeming uh, nature to it for a person that, uh, that poses. With the survivors that were shot, um, incredibly generous people who would just say, if I, I'm doing this because if one person sees this, and doesn't take out a gun, or if I can prevent this from happening to someone else, that's why I'm doing it. So the generosity of the people that I work with is unlike anything I've ever met with, with anyone else. They, they, the mothers don't want this to happen to other kids, and they want to keep the memory alive of their children, and the survivors don't want this to happen to anybody. And uh, Will, you showed us one uh, clip of one of your brother veterans. And I'm wondering, have you done other interviews, shared your work with the people you served with? Um, so right, so this was done in 2000, the, that thesis was done around 2015, 2016. But then uh, when, when Trump and that whole, whole kind of uh, way of thinking came about, a lot of my friends are Republicans, or they were they were independent or apolitical that became Republicans, uh -huh. and um, so it was really hard to continue. And I also was very specific to not ask them to sign the release. Uh -huh. That if you didn't want this to be shown when it's done, I would not show it. Uh -huh. And uh, and one one of the two men uh, we no longer speak, but we were best friends there. He was literally my best friend for a really long time. But um and but we no longer speak and and I and a lot of people were really apprehensive to speak very honestly that the way I felt was worth an audience time because a lot of them were, were kind of Republicans. Uh, and I'm very not a Republican. Not a Democrat, but I'm I'm definitely not a Republican. Okay. Um, obviously, an image can't be controlled, which is sort of one of the great things about it. It offers a freedom of response. But the, the time that we're living in is a sort of radical lack of control because of Photoshop, because of social media sites, because of all this dark web stuff. And I'm wondering if each of you thinks about th those issues when you're working, or is it just, I'm going to do this, let people use it in any way? <laughs> well, I don't think about it at all, but I don't have the attitude to like let anybody use it however they want. So, but I'm I'm not worrying about it. If somebody used it inappropriately, you could be sure that I would do what I could to have that removed from wherever it was or, you know, I mean, I have these are people. They're, I have a responsibility to the people that I photograph. And it's not just my work, it's them, their images. So I would, I would do what I had to do. Okay. <laughs> I, got my, I got my own. Um, um, I do think a lot about that question. I think a lot of us do, even within one project, because ultimately an artist, especially uh, all type, we are, manip ma we are manip manipulators, Jesus. Uh, as if you're like a, a filmmaker, you know the ending, and then you keep editing the same thing, so you do really care about every nuance and gesture. And then after, like, after a while, I just realized, and, and you know, we, we, there's like seven plus billion people on Earth who all think they're the main star of their own movie. And the truth is I probably can't affect that many people, but I could have, I could have my conviction. I'm just gonna go and make whatever work I wanna make, and I'll be able to defend it, and I might be wrong down the road, and when I'm wrong, and maybe I'll change some more. So at this point in my life, as long as I go in doing the homework, and have, have empathy, I would just do, I would push it as far as I can within, within my, my kind of like, like expertise, I guess. But yeah, I don't, I don't worry about other people <laughs> in general. 
Um, it's sort of striking, Kathy, in your work, not uh, obviously with the mothers, but even in the first book, how gendered a lot of the violence was, how many of these women had been shot by husbands, boyfriends. Um, I, I actually was very startled by that. And we, you know, the press tends to focus a lot on mass shootings because they're so hideous, Uvalde or whatever. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm interested in this question or what, you've, what you think about it of how much of this, how much of gun violence is actually violence against women. By, by people who presumably love them. Well, domestic violence has to be the, if, if, you, if everybody in this audience just imagines for a minute that the person that you love or that lo you, you did love, the closest person to you in your life is also trying to kill you. That's, you know, that's not just somebody trying to kill you. The person that you were closest with is trying to kill you. So domestic violence is a horrible crime. And uh, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of angry people and predominantly men. Very few women, uh, as an anecdotal thing, I've photographed so far probably 160 with the Miami people, 160 people who have been in these situations. I think five of them were shot by women and two of them were the accidents that I talked about with the chamber, uh, the bullet. So that means three women out of 160 people have have tried to kill somebody or were running around with a gun just shooting wildly. So I think that that's really scary to me that um, we have so many angry people and the availability of guns. So, Will, you ask me what I think art can do. Um, I guess what I don't think it can do, you know, there's a sort of expression often by, I guess, radicals, you know, that art is a weapon. I actually don't think that art is a weapon because a weapon has a very clear focus and a very clear aim and a very clear direction. And I, I, I really agree with what you were saying, Will, that that isn't what art does. All it can do is sort of open up questions. So it's actually sort of the opposite, I think, of a weapon. Um, and and I, I think that, you know, people who create art who think they can, it, it's going to have a particular effect um, are probably usually disappointed um, because its effect is something much more subtle, uncontrollable, maybe even unimaginable. And maybe this is both to agree with you, because you're, you're agreeing with me, so I'm just agreeing with myself. Um, <laughs> but, uh, to, <laughs> to, uh, I'm just trying to get something out of the crowd, something, anything. <sighs> uh, but honestly, I, I'm a big believer in my art education. I'm not I think the actual object or photograph that you make, it's, it's important, because it, you could send that to, uh, to, to anywhere, and then you hope, it's like, it's like throwing, throwing a rock, uh, and hopefully the ripple affects somebody. Because before my arts education, I have received that ripple that uh, John Baldessari did 50, 60 years ago. And I was like, oh my god, that, a pen was crooked. That looks like a tree. And it did affect me. John wasn't thinking about me at all at the time. But somehow, it did open up a, a, something that was like kind of cool. And then it made me think. So the object, I don't have a lot of expectation of an object. And I read, and, and I was going to say this too. I just read most of your article, and I'm still going through Crew Radiance now. But you've been writing this stuff. Your book was done, I believe, 2010. And, and then your articles on Ukraine and so on. So like, I, I don't have expectation of the actual end product, because all I could do is throw it out there and, and make it seen earnestly, which is I do the window gallery. I also, I'm also, I, I sit, I gallery sit a lot, and I would say most of the time no one shows up, except for the opening. So it's like, it just hits me that you have to make the work, but then you also have to be, be sincere in putting the work out there. Also, in some way, you're just lying to yourself, but I do believe in the art education as a whole. I do believe in this conversation, that even if two people 
were amused by what I'm saying, the way that John Baldessari amused me or Sophie Cal, whatever it is when I first started, then I have done my job. I'm just one person. So if one person could motivate another or maybe one more, I have done my end. I'm just, I'm just one person. So I do believe because you wrote something that, that hit me about, about the Caesar, uh, Caesar Syrian photographer that, that a lot of liberal democracy didn't absolutely zero, you said. I think your word was zero. And that's how I felt. I mean, I've been to a lot of those places. And I've also been in Ukraine early this year. And that's why I'm very hands-on. Because if you don't, if your mind is already changed, because I changed my own mind, right? I'm making the work already. And if I'm not doing it, if our goal is not recycling, if uh, Guadalupe is not like doing mutual aid, then who is, right? So I think, it, I do believe, and um, I do love this education. And that's why I always come back. OK. Um, I think we're going to open it up to some questions now from the floor. Uh, yeah, the gentleman back there. Hold on. Oh, OK. Got a mic. Can you? Sorry. Yeah, I, I believe that when you, I'm a fine arts photographer, and I believe when I go out and I photograph, I'm saying something about the subject, but I'm also saying something about myself. With that line of thinking, uh, I need to say that I admire your work, but I'm left with wondering, what is this work about you? I, I, I have a hard time seeing it. Me? Maybe you can help me. Is it me particular or? Uh, both of you. Okay. I said before that I don't want to um, have something that I can, uh, that I feel that I can do something about um, not to make an effort to try to get people to see that this is something that's affecting everyone in America. And my goal is to bring the face of survivors and people who have suffered from gun violence there out to um, the world. Now, why am I doing this? I, there's many reasons why I do, I do what I do. I have had a gun pointed in my face in a robbery. I know what it feels like to have my life hang in the balance of a crazy man with a gun. My child was uh, 15 months old. This was a robbery in my house. A push, uh, somebody dressed as a postal worker coming into my house with a gun. I understand what it feels like to be at the mercy of a gun. And as the survivors that I've photographed said, I will say the same thing. I don't want anybody to feel that powerlessness of letting someone control your destiny or the destiny of the person that you love. So I am an American as well, and I feel what is going on in this country that people need to have guns? Now, if I lived out west, if I lived in a remote place, I probably would have a gun because I would be afraid or animals, whatever. I'm not condemning guns, but what does a big ass man have to have 20 AK-47s in his garage? Why do people have to, have to feel that they have to go out and be the good guy with the gun or whatever? This is insanity. And if I can do something to talk about this, to bring this out to people, to show that this affects everyone. I have children. I have grandchildren. I, do I want my grandchildren going to school now and having to do these drills and, and worry about somebody coming into the school? I don't want people to have to live like that now. I didn't live like that. I don't want the young generation to feel that they are never safe. 
That's why I do this. Because if I can make a difference, and, I can, and I'm not against guns, I'm against irresponsible gun ownership and not talking about responsible gun laws. I, it, many people have guns, and, and they're good people. But what's happening in this country now is twisted and crazy and getting more so. And I do this because I, for all of those reasons, I don't want this to happen to anyone else. Do you still need mine? I, I, we could just move to the next question, I think. Okay. Unless there's no question. Was that live? So, um, do you want me to stand up? Yeah, please, stand right. up. So there's a couple of things that have come up. I mean, it's a very interesting discussion, very moving. Um, some years ago, I was on a panel with Kathy, and we, one of the things that's missing here and that was in the panel that we did together, as Kathy well remembers, was um, people who had been shot themselves. And those testimonies and the people behind them were enormously both moving but also very persuasive. They were people who were on a mission in many cases. And, and those testimonies and those people, I thought, kind of embodied the realities that the photographs give us in two dimensions. So it's, it's, it really, it, it has another dimension that's really, I think, enormously important. That said, um, more shocking than this was a project that was done, I think, 10 years ago that was exactly the opposite of all these pictures. And it was a project called Young Americans, which some of you may remember. The photos were published, I think, in The New Yorker. And they were done by somebody who is usually a fashion photographer. And what they were were simply pictures of young people with weapons from the United States. And they were not people who lived in very difficult circumstances. They were all upper middle class kids. And they all had weapons. And many of those weapons were heavy. That is, they were AK-47s and, and M-16s and automatic weapons. And they were part of the world in which these kids grew up. Very responsible parents, good target shooters, and that's how, they, that's how they thought about their world. And my question is, what's the impact of these photographs for them, for that world, which is essentially the world that, you know, that creates a background of gun use, or let's call it gun normalization. And the second thing I want is more towards Susie, uh, um, things that you've been thinking about. You made some points sort of in passing that I think we, if we had more time, it would be really good to unpack. The one that really jumped out at me was like the forensic aspect. We've been talking about photographs primarily. We haven't made a distinction between how artists use photography and how photographers do their job and where those pictures go. But you made a really, really interesting point in passing about what happens to these pictures when they finally exist out in the world? Usually we think about them as things in circulation and anybody can attach a meaning to them. But what about the forensic use of these pictures? How important is that, do you think? You were talking, again, you were talking about, about Syria. But I, I'd like to get your thought about that kind of forensic life of these pictures. Uh, yeah, so f photographs are documents. Uh, they are, I believe, an old-fashioned idea. They are documents of reality. Uh, and yeah, I mean, they, they hopefully, this, the Caesar photographs, needless to say, he's completely appalled that nothing happened as a result of all this and him risking his life, et cetera. Not yet. Not yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, there definitely are prosecutors who have gone through them. The same thing right now exactly is happening in Ukraine. There are a lot of war crimes uh, prosecutors there. They're photographing the mass graves, the evidence, and you know one hopes <laughs> for some justice in the world um, that uh, certain people will end up at the Hague. We hope, uh, but I, I do think even if that doesn't happen, uh, you know Martha Gellhorn, war journalist, at one point she became very disillusioned with journalism. You know, she covered the Spanish Civil War. She was warning about fascism. Nobody listened. And she actually, after World War II, retreats for a while. And then she comes back 
to journalism, and she says, you know, journalism isn't going to change the world, but she said it's really important for human beings to have a record of what we do to each other. And I, I, I agree with that, and I think photographs are part of that record. How they will be used remains to be seen. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm you, a former can you student. Stand up so we oh, can see I'm sorry. You. Thanks. Hello, I'm Chris Gennaro. I'm a former student, uh, graduating in 2018. Hey, Will. Uh, Kathy, I have your book. It was a great book. I, you signed it, actually, so thank you for that. Um, I'm currently in a journalism program now, actually, at CUNY's uh, Craig Newmark, oh, wow. and I'm using this as part of my legal class. But uh -huh. one thing that we're talking about in journalism um, is how Photographs are, maybe we should show some of these images, uh, graphic as they might be. And I feel like there's a lot of quibbling with editors with what to show, what not to show. Meanwhile, there is a lot more of like TikTok journalism happening, which obviously isn't going through quite as much censorship. But on the, the other side of it is it's fleeting. It's gone after you know a day. And those images are gone and don't get to maybe have the full impact that they could have had, and I'm guessing, I guess I just wanted to know your thoughts on that and whether you think that's a good thing, or it could improve upon as far as, again, just making those images have a lasting impact, but again, I think it's a good thing that more people are photographing, obviously, and sharing their truths. Um, the downside is that it's so fleeting, and because it's individuals, it might not get the impact it deserves, and I was wondering if you could talk about that. Are you addressing that to me? And the whole panel. Okay. I mean, I'm a terrible person to answer that because I'm not, my, my students consider me a dinosaur. I'm not on social media. I do not tweet. I am not on Facebook. I am not on Instagram. I am not on TikTok. Um, I do know that last uh, semester I taught a course called Women in War. This is when Ukraine started. And my students were saying, oh, you know, we're getting all these images all the time on Instagram, but we don't know what's real. And I basically told them, get off of Instagram. Um, and that there are other places that you can look. So yes, I know that social media can sometimes have its progressive aspects. Obviously, what's going on now in Iran, people were using social media, um, although now all the social media has been uh, shut down there. But I, I, I actually think, at least from what my students tell me, that this sort of deluge of images that they're getting on TikTok, Instagram, sort of really uh, degrades, is that the word, the impact of anything. And it also puts them in this sort of weird uh, place of having no idea of what reality is. And that sort of really actually scares me a lot. Uh, but as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm the least knowledgeable person um, about that. Well, um, I want to jump in. Um, usually this happens when I'm high or like a mushroom, but I'm not. Um, but I'm going to go there. Um, um, this is just my opinion, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know it, but like, your truth is your truth. Um, there's no meaning to life. And that's just me, though. I'm not saying. Our body was created and is functioning strictly to survive. We, we pump blood, we breathe. Uh, when it hurts, we hurt. Like when we, when we touch electricity, we hurt. When we, have a, when we need to expel poison, we, we have diarrhea. Um, that's our main goal, the body's goal. And we, our feelings are mostly chemical and your organ. Having said that, we have versus a lot of beings on Earth. And, and they might be a god, they might not be a god. I don't know. I'm not in any way this. But chances are the god, if there is a god, is probably not the ones already been described. That's just my feeling. But I don't want to get in a fight with nobody. Um, so having said all that, everything else is a construct. We are built to continue to survive. And, and we care. We don't care. <laughs> but we care as much as we, we could tolerate in our body. And I, I'm someone with uh, past trauma, so to speak. They told me I have PTSD. 
I am a 100% rated uh, dis disabled veteran, which explains why I don't work. Um, so I'm considered really crazy. Um, so I don't have to be on Mushroom to be crazy to talk like this. So what I'm trying to say is, before we talk about what art can and can't do, the conversation I had is, how big is our bubble of privilege? A lot of people don't care about Syria or whatever. It's because they don't envision themselves ever being affected by that. Now with so much information, because when I grew up, there was like three networks. Fox was not even around back then. I had a beeper, uh, <laughs> which is awesome. I type hello on my beeper all the time. Um, this is my joke to kind of break it up. Um, we have to really examine as, as, a, as a society or even a human race, how big is our bubble of care? I'm gonna say for me at this point, I care about all human as much as I can. Not equally, but I try to care. I don't care about space people yet. So when someone, and, and that's why I'm willing to, to go to Ukraine, I'm willing to do all those things because I'm willing to put my body for ideas, for democracy. And, um, but art, like before art could mean anything for like the masses, I think collectively we have to have therapy and really ask, do we really care? Because I don't think we care. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're, you're not made to care. If you do care, that's why I'm around you. I'm only around with people that care. But I think the vast majority of people don't care. And I think this is why it's an uphill battle to do art, because we assume that people give a shit. And, and most of the time, they don't. And that's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean they're bad people. My, my parents don't give a shit. I mean, they're not bad people. Got to, sorry. Sorry, OK. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to go back to the question, I think. Um, I think these kind of questions are very difficult to answer because we're all different and we all see things differently. Uh, somebody that's uh, watching TikTok all the time, there's, a, I think, less of a reality to it and it almost becomes like a movie. And I question if that, looking at that, that they are actually think they're seeing something real. So, you know, you're, there, there's so many things. Some people are like, when I went to the Holocaust Museum, seeing the mountain of shoes at the Holocaust Museum was f far more powerful to me than seeing all the photos that were there. So I, we're all different. Somebody else could say, oh, you're crazy. You know, those, did you see those pictures? Did you see how skinny the people were, this and that? It, we're all different. Things affect everyone differently. I may be sound of mind to be able to watch somebody on TikTok, you know, beating the crap out of somebody and just not think about it again. And not even, you know, I don't know if that's sound of mind. That might be crazy to just not think about it. But yeah, but so these, these questions with, you know, should we see violence? Should we not see violence? Should social media do it? They're almost impossible to answer. I think that we start to um, objectify things, and we're all very different. So um, I, I don't know. I can't, I'm going to say I don't know if it's good or it's bad. I, I'm not the kind of person that likes to see violence, and when I see it, I get anesthetized to it. Now you might say, well, why are you taking pictures of scars? That's not really violence to me. That's, that, that's something that has, I don't want to see those photos of the eyes gouged out. I would never look at that. I have no interest in seeing that. Uh, my imagination makes it happen inside of my mind and that's horrible enough. But some people do need to see that. So I, it, it, we, I, it's very hard to answer the question. And um, you, you can figure it out in your journalism class and let us know because I can't really give a, <laughs> yes, get back to me. I'm gonna answer this uh, in a more serious way and I do it quickly. Um, this, this conversation is always gonna be, it, it was at Falling Man and uh, at the 9-11, it's the same thing, not grotesque, but invoked a lot of emotion. My thing is, as an artist, or as a human being, I want to know as much truth as I can before I leave. Um, so the question about publishing something is really about like the editor and about, it's no different than museums right now. Like 
you know, the museums are kind of like an intro to art is because they, they're meant to be mainstream. But, and that's why I always say it's about like your conviction. If you're willing to maybe lose that assignment, I would always push to have the image that you could, you, you, you really believe in. Of course, you don't, you might not have the power, you're not the editor, but you always go for the true, true, always. Because you, and, and then we die. I, young woman here. I also, I was uh, waiting to get in here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm Joseph. I'm uh, my second of three years in the program right now. Um, and I totally, you know, am on the same page with a lot of what we've been talking about with like what art can do and how it has to be about like individual effects on people emotionally or intellectually um, and how that affects the way those people individually live their lives and in their communities. Um, but I'm kind of more curious about how things like that affect your working styles and all the different work that all three of you do. How do you approach when you have issues like this that are so high stakes and that you are even often so personally invested in working with people who are in opposition to you? Um, you know, you brought up in your book photographing people who are NRA members or members of law enforcement and you know juxtaposing that against things like domestic violence and knowing contextually the issues with domestic violence uh, rates amongst members of law enforcement or the ways that gun violence bleeds from law enforcement into impoverished communities. And I'm just curious how you manage creating a body of work of any kind that you have a specific and invested point of view in while collaborating with and documenting and discussing the viewpoints and even sometimes platforming the viewpoints of people who are in opposition to you or represent or members of factions that may be in opposition to you. I like to think that I can communicate with everyone. <laughs> that, that might not be true um, sometimes, but I will try to um, look. Uh, there's there's certain things that that we have in common as people, and those are the things that that you can draw on when you're working with people who are different than you. Now, the NRA member, and I happen to be good friends now, we never talk politics. I'm sure he voted for Trump. I'm sure he did. But he's actually a wonderful person in other ways. And he works, with, he's from Memphis, and he's working with young men in Memphis who have been in gangs and have used guns, and he works on a, uh, in a group talking to, to young men who are very different than him. And he has very good points. So when, I, when I'm with somebody that I'm different from, I'm trying to look at the positive things and the connections that we have. And with this book, one of the highlights of my doing it was I went to Bozeman, Montana, and I love Montana, so I'm not putting Montana down. But um, I was asked to, I, I had, as Lyle talked about, I had book signings and survivors in every place on panels with me. And I was asked to be on talk radio in Bozeman. And I was, was like, OK, great. So I went to the, the radio station, and I went, it was a tiny studio, and there was some guy talking like, and I said to the woman that brought me in, he was in a, the soundproof room, I said, is that the man that I'm going to be interviewed by? And she shook her head and I said, is he a Trumpster? Because <laughs> he was like very loud and vocal. And she said, like this, and I said, oh no, I have to be on with him for one hour? And she said, she, all she did was shake her head. I was like, oh, I am screwed. This is like not going to be good. How am I going to get through this? To make a very long story short, 
Everything went well. He agreed with me on so many things. People called in and were you know, saying things to me about, oh, uh, you know, don't take my gun and all this, but he never said anything like that. I never said that. After the hour went by, it turned out that he was from Staten Island, and as somebody that grew up in Brooklyn, I was like, I knew there was something familiar about him. So afterwards, on the radio uh, web page, there was a glowing review of my book. Fantastic, because he had said to me when he was interviewing me, I don't want any crazy guy online in a store with me with a gun. I don't want that. So he, there were things we could talk about. So on the, the whole interview was like this great book and I, uh, fantastic. And at the bottom of the page, uh, the web page, were Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, and all the right-wing talk show people smiling out. And here was the interview of my book. So that to me was one of the highlights of what I did because we all can connect to people if we make an effort. And just because we disagree on some things doesn't mean that we can't connect. So I'd say to anybody, if you're working and you, you have to photograph somebody that you're not really crazy about, try to, try to find that little thing, even if you talk about you know, a, a sports or something that, that will make you feel the humanness of the other person. And, um, I guess, uh, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead. Um, I mean, I want, I mean, however much time I have left, uh, if you have any question, we could just keep going. But I do want to say, um, art is always for another person. I find that where it is this period or whatever, I find a lot of people just make art as if it's a science project, and certainly science could be part of your art. But art is always about communicating. And to me, art is always a conversation. Like, this is my art practice sitting here. I am kind of doing a performance for you so that we could have a conversation, so that maybe one of you would come back. So a lot of being an artist is about communicating. And you have to embrace communicating, however way that manifests in your practice. Um, because you're doing it because you want to connect uh, first with yourself and then to someone else. This young woman has had her hand up for a long time. <laughs> well, <here. laughs> Hi, um, Gail Buckman. Yes. Um, number, Stand up. Uh, um, a number of years ago, I wrote a book called True Crime Picture, uh, Shots in the Dark True Crime Pictures, and it accompanied a court television program on crime and forensic photography. Uh. So the book covered a lot portraiture of um, victims and um, criminals, it, police work, I did the whole history of the history of forensic photography starting in the 19th century. Um, but I was teaching at Cooper Union, I teach the history of photography, and it was beginning kind of the internet, and my students were interested, like, like you guys were interested in this subject, but they were telling me about websites, and you, somebody mentioned that we have to be able to differentiate the Hollywood version of crime from true crime. And on the internet, there were very violent pictures, and I realized I had to go there. But these photographs were floating without context, and that was very problematic. Um, even, even autopsy photographs of John F. Kennedy's <laughs> assassination, were, which were supposed to be locked in the National Archives, mm -hmm. had been stolen and put on the web. So I had a lot of decisions of what to publish and what yeah. not. I did publish the autopsy photographs of JFK because had they been seen in the Warren Court, the conspiracy theories wouldn't have um, uh -huh. per perpetuated. But the point was is that things were floating and, and that was problematic. Nobody was talking about it. And then I was asked to do an exhibition at the Chelsea Art Museum based on my book. And this was before Abu Ghraib. And I think
think it might have been the first time a, a curator downloaded photographs from the internet and put them on a museum wall. And I got a lot of grief for that, but it started a conversation then Abu Ghraib came and we realized, even though my book covered the whole history, that you know, the tabloid photograph of Billinger shot, you know, on the front page was no longer the crime photograph that was existing. And I I just want to say because of my book and because of the exhibition, um, when Daniel Pearl was beheaded um, in Afghanistan, he was a journalist who trusted somebody and gone for an interview, um, and then he was beheaded. The New York Times called me and asked me, Gail, what do you think? Should we publish that beheading photograph? And um, that's why I'm asking the question, because I felt what Charlie said and what you said at the beginning, there's so many different contexts, and you might disagree with me, but what I said to the Times, and this was my opinion, is it was so raw, and the widow was so present with her child that I'm glad the photo existed, and I would publish that photograph in a historical book, because we have to know what the Holocaust looked like, we have to know what violence looks like, we have, but not on a newspaper, not on the front page, so it really comes to, I think all the photographs are important, but there's different contexts where we should exhibit and publish them. And um, that's, you know, back to the question, you know, so many decisions. Thank you. Pakistan, he was killed in Pakistan. Oh, Pakistan, sorry. You know, there's one slight flaw in your argument uh, you said that if those autopsy photos had been uh, published of JFK, there wouldn't have been conspiracy theories. But I think the whole point of a conspiracy theories is that they're sort of immune to evidence. Um, uh, they're not really tethered to evidence. Uh, and then they often have a life of their own. I mean, look, look at you know the people who deny that Sandy Hook ever happened. Uh, so so, I mean, that, it's, that's a very optimistic spin you're putting on it, and I wish that were true, but I actually think that that's not true. I think that conspiracy theories fill a much different need and that people are totally capable of ignoring photographic evidence. I think more and more, but when JFK was assassinated, it was, it was a different world. It was a different world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a less crazy world. Hi, um, I'm a first year student here. And um, so many of us come from places where gun violence, a gun is prohibited to be owned by individuals. But violence is always present. So that's not, these are not unfamiliar topics to us. But it just, and that's why it, it really impresses me that how powerful these images are. Um, extremely, just because it's visible. And um, my question would be, so and you all have several projects, and the initial projects I'll start with what violence look like, because those are really strong images. When you look at it, there are just scars and survivors of violence, gun violence, and we look at it, we recognize immediately what it is. And later on, you all move to a different, or like uh, reality of that that world in terms of we sort of move closer to the survivors where whoever's experienced that, and then we understand what violence really is uh, rather than what it looks like. So I, um, my question would be, what do you consider as the importance of, um, the importance of making these photographs are? Because these are one of the most difficult images to be made ever. And do you think that's changing for you as you move on to making more of these images or different approaches of these images? I, the thing is that, I mean, you're touching on something that I touched on with the shoes in the Holocaust Museum. Um, sometimes if, if I look at an object 
the memento that somebody brings me of their child, that's very powerful. That might be more powerful than looking at a scar. It, all of this is, all depends on how you're feeling that day, what it touches in your past, how the person presents it. I mean, it's, it's, all of these things have emotion. It's not, not always the visible that's so obvious that is the, the, the real thing that makes you, you know, upset or think. It's sometimes it's, it's something that's triggering a past memory that you have. So when I photographed the mothers in the location, somebody in Miami, I photographed a mom who had a two-year-old boy that was killed. And I asked her to bring, she told me that she had some of his toys, and I asked her to tell me about them. And she said she had a, a car that she had bought him that he rode in, an electric car. And she brought that to the park where he used to play. And that was very powerful. As somebody that is a mother and, you know, sees this vehicle and this woman and the and then I had her give me a picture of him on her cell phone and put that in the car and that was that was very strong that was stronger than um, a, a, a scar for me so it depends it really depends um, you, you, if you're looking to to get at get to know the person and get to know what the person wants you to know about them because people all, always give you what they want to give you when you do portraits. You just have to have the patience and the time with them to get it. But the strongest things are not always um, so obvious. Maybe um I don't know. I don't. I don't even know if I'm answering this question. Uh, but I, my thought, I think what you're asking is, and what what I what I thought about. I don't make work as if I'm the center of my topic. I don't have to be. I just have. It's almost like being a politician. I just want the best person to win, and I only do things that I feel it hasn't done, where I know what I'm talking about. So that's why my art practice went to being a gallerist or a curator or a visiting crit is because I felt like that was there were there were too many good artists and not enough opportunities. I'm still advocating about being an American soldier, apologizing and, and being accountable for the Iraq or the war of terror. Because it's still and, and this is my problem. I'm very much pro Ukraine and but so much of how we look at China or Russia is exactly how the world looked at the US for the last 20 years. And I have the, the card holding ability as a veteran, uh, as an independent to talk. So I will continue to talk until some, someone better comes along. But I hope everyone here, whatever your practice is the next five, 10 years, I like to think that in the end, we're all part of like an era that's 2000, 2022, whatever it is, that we are all just kind of doing this together and we all feed off of each other. So I learned so much from the younger people. Like I, I'm, I'm, I was born in Hong Kong, but I never, I, I never could get a visa to go to China. And the way I found that Chinese younger people think, they use a lot of internet, a lot of gaming, as also a way to speak about freedom and censorship but I didn't understand that at all because I'm older. And so I think for me it's about not controlling anything. And that the older I get, the future, it's, I, I will never be part of the future more as I get older. I will always be closer to death, unfortunately, maybe fortunately. But so I think, I like to think that, that I'm talking to the future just from a probability standpoint, unless you get hit by a truck tonight, unfortunately, if that happens. So just try to think of it. We're all doing this together. <laughs> I feel like there's a stand-up in there as well. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. 
there a final thought? Yes. Um, I mean, the debate, what, what to look at, what to show, what not to show, is going to go on. But I, I feel that there are people with greater consciousness about the horror of conflict and violence guns. And having great pictures, I think, made a big difference when we saw them about yeah. what that period was about. It was about you know, the brutality and mindlessness of, of, of an administration. And the difference between <laughs> perhaps the good and the bad, for lack of a better term, is a pretty small percentage. If you could just move a few people to what we'll call the good side, it can make a big difference in how our politics, at least in this country, play out. And there's a great divide in this country. And part of the divide is that certain classes don't see issues because they're in a bubble. And other classes don't see other issues because they're in a bubble. We have to get out of the bubble that all of us inevitably are in, irrespective of how worldly we think we are or cosmopolitan. And getting out of that bubble, I think, means looking. <laughs> looking at others, getting to know others. One of the beauties of photography and the lens arts, the video industry, is we can go search. We can go wander and discover. Get out of your damn hood. Get out of your past and look at somebody different. And um, that's what, you know, and, and maybe we will even inevitably can commit some certain kinds of crimes doing that. But at least we're doing it uh, with some intention to do the right thing. And sometimes we stumble on the wrong thing. But the difference between good and bad is it's a small percentage. It's a very fine line. If you can move a few people, and I think all three of these people are going to do it. Thank you.